Good morning and welcome. We're really happy that you're here to worship with us this morning. Our call to worship comes from Psalms 138. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. Let's bow down for an opening word of prayer. Our Father, this day may bring some hard task to our life or some hard trial to our love. We may grow weary or sad or hopeless in our lot. But Father, our whole life until now has been one great proof of your care. Bread has come for our body, thoughts to our mind, love to our hearts, and all blessing from you. May this day be full of power that shall bring us from near to you and make us more like you, Jesus. O oh God, may we trust you that this day, that when the day is done, our trust in you shall be firmer than ever. Then, when our last day comes and our work is done, may we trust you in death and forever. In the spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Set a fire down in my soul 
scripture for today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 to 26. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. 
But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown in prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. May God bless the reading of his word. Greetings and good day to everyone. May the peace and the blessing of the Lord be upon you and your household. And I hope and pray that today as we dive into the Word of God that you will be blessed, that you will be challenged and comforted by what He is going to teach us today. It is nice to be back from my paternity leave. You know, Sandra went back to work in late August and she's back to transition to being part -time, in a part-time capacity and I needed to get used to taking care of all the kids while Sandra goes to work twice a week. I missed the church family. I miss Pastor Andrew, Pastor Joseph, meeting up with them every week uh, virtually. But it was great last weekend to see our church family, you know, for Thanksgiving Sunday and just being with each other and singing together. Uh, so it was just a great blessing that way. If you're wondering how the kids are doing well, the kids are all doing well. Everyone is healthy and everyone is happy. And this week, this past Tuesday, our oldest son, Lucas, had his birthday and he is now 12 years old. And I can't believe it that in one year, next year, that we're going to have our first teenager in our home. And this got me reminiscing when Lucas was, was younger, around one and a half, two years old. I want to tell you a story. I'm ashamed of it, of what happened, but I want to share it with you. So our firstborn son, Lucas, love him to death, our, our joy giver, and we had a good relationship. But in that age run, between one and two or two and a half, it's potty training time. You know, potty training, if you're wondering what it is, it's, it's a tough one. That is when the parents are teaching the kids how to do their toilet business using the toilet instead of their diapers. So doing num number one and two in the toilet instead of their diapers. So in this potty training, we're teaching him. Sandra was at work. It's my first time, couple of weeks, you know, teaching Lucas how to, how to potty train and just I'm by myself. And then there's this moment where he said he needed to go use the potty. So we ran to the toilet open up the potty and just about he was about to go and he did and he missed the potty totally. He was a young kid back then, right? And I was like, all this work and then you missed, it was right there beside you. And I lost my cool. My temper just skyrocketed so fast because that means I have so much stuff to clean up now and out of anger my voice went higher and louder and my fist went like this and I hit the potty with my fist and the potty just went crack right there just cracked right in the middle and I was like I can't believe this here's the picture Here's the picture of the potty, all duct tape holding it together. Have you ever felt like this before? Losing your cold, losing your temper? Or even for you, like just asking you, like, or for you to think, when was the last time you got angry? You may be angry right now. Angry at whom? The person sitting beside you, your spouse, significant other, any family members, or some co-workers or some neighbors. See, anger surprises us sometimes. I remember a Marvel movie where uh, Captain America asked Hulk, it's like, you know, 
Maybe you're just like Hawk. He says, Cap, this is my secret. That's my secret, Captain. I am always angry. Ready to Hulk smash. I wonder if you're like that. You're just always angry. So when this happens, when sin happens, guess who gets the brunt of the anger? Most of the time, it's the ones that we love, our family. Mom, dad, brother, sister, whoever lives at home, Lolo, Lola, auntie, uncle, whoever it is. So we still have this party in our home and every time I see it, I'm reminded of my sinful nature. The ugliness that's in me. I never would have thought that I would be capable of anger, that I would break something. Because I always pictured myself as a calm guy. See, just because, I realize, just because I'm a, a Christian, just because I'm a pastor, it doesn't mean that I don't sin anymore. I'm still human. I am a sinner saved by grace, and I don't take that grace for granted. I am, ne I am in need of Jesus Christ every moment of the day. So in that moment, Lucas saw his daddy get angry. He saw his dad lose his temper at him. And I latched on the party. You know, his dad raised his voice. I broke something. I broke that party. But I broke something more precious than the party that day. I broke my relationship with Lucas. That is the most important thing. My relationship with Lucas was good. It was intact. But because of that, that spurt of anger, I drove a wedge between us. The sin of anger drew, drew a wedge, just, just drove a wedge between me and Lucas. And you're wondering, what is a wedge? Well, a wedge is an object that is placed between a thing in order to separate it, just like this illustration right here. So if you are chopping wood, a wedge is an object that you place between a tree, tree trunk, in order to split it a lot easier. So I did something that separated myself and Lucas, a wedge between our relationship. See, a relationship separated must be reunited. See, this is what I want to do. I want to fix my separated relationship with my son. When anger came, relationship is broken and separated. People get hurt. Both parties get hurt. Lucas and myself. And other people get hurt along the way too. I had to explain to Sanja what happened and I was honest and I was candid. So my question to everyone, is there a wedge between you and someone today? Married couple, is there a wedge between the two of you? Family members, is there a wedge between the two of you? Before some, some of you, and even relatives, a wedge between your coworkers, your neighbors, or even our own church family, is there a wedge between any of us. See, anger is serious business. There is a seriousness to anger. In a reading for today, in Matthew 5, 21, 22, Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of counsel. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Danger of judgment, of counsel, and hellfire. See, now how do you get Things back to normal. Things There's a wedge now. Things have been separated. How do you restore a relationship? How do you take away that wedge? How do you reconcile? So the sermon for today is not necessarily about anger or how to control your anger, but I really want to focus on more about relationship and how to restore and reconcile a separated relationship. 
See, a healthy relationship, you know, that, that gets separated because of sin, because of that wedge has broken, has cracked, and formed the separation between in that relationship. It must be re re reunited. Things must be reconciled once again. Let me ask you this question then. Who here, any of you who's listening right now, who amongst you likes and loves staying angry? Who here likes it when there's beef, you have beef with someone? Who enjoys having animosity or having a wedge between you and another person or other people? Do you enjoy that? And if you don't, there's a way to getting things back the way it was before. There's a way to make things better. And the solution is found in the scriptures, in the Bible. And part of our scripture reading today teaches us how to do so. So let's look at it verse by verse and see what it says. As we continue with our verse, in verse 23, it says, Therefore, if you are bringing your gift to the altar... See, in the biblical times, let's look back a bit, like behind those pages. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, we don't bring gifts to the altar anymore. So in the biblical times, the Pharisees, right, the high priests and all those things, would urge a person to cover for their malice, to cover for their hatred, spite, for their nastiness. What you need to do, what they recommend for you to do, is, is that you bring a sacrifice to the temple to make things right between you and God. The word is atonement. See, atonement in Cambridge Dictionary, which states simply that atonement is something that you do to show that you are sorry for something that you did. Dictionary.com puts it this way concerning atonement. It is the satisfaction or reparation for a wrong or injury. In Christianity, sacrificial offerings to remove, atonement is this, sacrificial offerings is to remove the effects of sin in the New Testament. It refers specifically to the reconciliation between God and humanity, affected by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Atonement, put together, once again, whatever is separated has been reconciled, has been atoned. Let's go back to the verse again. In 23, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, okay, picture this. Let us time travel to the biblical times and put yourself in a person's shoes or sandals, okay? You are lined up, getting ready for atonement. You're holding your animal, ready to make a sacrifice to make things right between you and God. And you're just waiting for your turn to sacrifice your animal, and then bam, it hits you. You have something against someone, or someone has something against you. Let's look at the read, let's look at verse 23, uh, a whole part of it. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you. Either you have wronged someone or they have wronged you. There's just something against both of you. There's a wedge between both of you. There is beef. There is something. How can we wrong someone? If you're thinking, like, you know, there's so many ways how we can wrong someone. How can we offend someone? Or you can be offended. I think one is you can be, we can offend people by our words, by the words that we use, coarse language, or directly calling them, like, words that degrade or that put you down or destroy like calling someone stupid or ugly or fat or the words i hate you and or you ignoramus and all those things words can hurt words can offend and of course our actions can also hurt pulling a prank pulling a joke or just hitting someone so many kinds of actions that can hurt and did you know also that non-action ignoring people Silent treatment, not doing something, that can also offend someone. You know that non-action can be as damaging as actions. Allowing someone to wallow in their own sin 
not rebuking them, not correcting them, not intervening. So as a parent, for me, if I stop telling my kids, like, you know, stop playing with the knives, or, you know, if my kid is eating a rock or broken glass in the park, I'm like, I have to stop them. So my non-action or inaction will actually harm them. See, our non-actions can also be damaging. And actually, even some of our things that we don't say, even as simple as facial expression can hurt someone. So there are probably a number of things that we have done that offend people, but it's really too hard to get each and everyone cleared up. But when you are in the midst of worship, worshiping the Lord, giving yourself as a holy and living sacrifice, there and then, when God reminds you of a, bro or of a brother or sister, there is something against you. There's a wedge between two of you. You know what you should do if that happens? You know, it's kind of like you're bringing your sacrifice and in modern times you're worshiping God and then God starts bringing the people into your minds that there's a wedge in there. God is calling us to do something and the Bible is telling us what to do. Jesus is telling us what to do in our passage. Let's continue in verse 24. Jesus says this, Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. It's very much just saying, stop. Stop worshiping. Leave your gift there for before the gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Leave the line, leave the gift, leave your offering, go your way, go and do what? First, be reconciled. To quickly seek reconciliation. Seek being reunited. Seek mending the relationship. Take away the wedge that separates. Fix the relationship with a brother or a sister. A relationship separated must be reunited. A relationship once, you know, united like me and Lucas and maybe you and your spouse, then it gets separated because of anger, because of words, because of silence, because of action and non-action, because of facial expression. Something has put a wedge in there. Sin has put a wedge between you and someone. Now that must be reunited. And how do we reunite a separated, a damaged, a wedge relationship? And the word is reconcile. We reconcile. Verse 24 says, First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Reconcile, strong concordance. The original word is caralasso. It means to restore to friendship or harmony. To reestablish a close relationship between to settle or to resolve, to bring to oneself to acceptance. And other words that might connect with this is, you know, to patch things up, to rectify, bring them to terms, to bring together, to bury the hatchet, you know, to come together, to fix up, to kiss and make up, to reestablish or to restore harmony. See, it is the change for the better a relationship between two or more persons. Theologically, it refers to the change of relationship between God and man. That's what it is. To restore relationship, relationship between God and man. Just like the broken relationship that I had with Lucas because of my sin, a wedge created, you know, created that separated us, between us. But as a child of God, I am being called to reconcile my relationship with God him. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. But you might be thinking, you might be asking, what if, what if the person you offended or the person whom you broke relationship with, you know, that there's a separation in that relationship, what if they are not open to reconcile back with you? What if they want nothing to do with you? What then? What can I do? So that means I can't approach God anymore? 
See, not every person may be open to your request of reconciliation, or be of relationship being restored again. But that does not mean that we should not attempt to make amends. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do something about it. Paul, in Romans 12, 17 to 18, he says, Repay no evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So just if you feel like they're not going to forgive you or not ask for forgiveness, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Which doesn't mean that we should not do anything. Let's not repay evil with evil. But let's live peaceably with all men. That's what it says. So we are to do everything we can to be reconciled with the other person. Let us remain loyal to the truths of God's word and obey what he is calling us to do. In Matthew 5, 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Jesus did not say, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they avoid conflict. No, a peacemaker does not avoid confrontation at all costs to maintain peace. We are to have these tough conversations with people. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. As I read this, as I was studying this over and over, as I read this passage over and over again, a phrase and an image comes to my mind as I continue to read this verse. It says, be reconciled. The, the phrase for me is be reconciled horizontally and vertically. What do I mean by this? If you read the verse, you can kind of see it. First, be reconciled with your brother, horizontal relationship, and then come and offer your gift, vertical relationship. That's relationship with God. So be reconciled horizontally with your brothers and sisters in Christ and vertically with God. Why? In Colossians 3.13, I love what he says, bearing one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you, so you also must do. Christ has forgiven you, has forgiven us, and we must offer that forgiveness to others also. So as we look at this, and I started thinking, what are the ingredients needed to, you know, to being reconciled with someone? You know, a relationship that's been separated must be reunited. And how do we approach those who have offended us, or that we have offended? See, to reconcile is challenging, and it causes us to an uncomfortable place. But the first ingredient that I can think of Right, especially in our text, it says it's first thing that you have to do is you got to do something quickly. There's quickness to this. So let's paint a picture again, looking at our verse. You're there lining up. Therefore, if you're bringing your gift to the altar, there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly. There's a quickness. Don't wait. Do it ASAP. It is not about, you know what, let me finish my offering first. Let me singing songs of praise to God first. Let me finish taking communion first. Then I will go and ask my brother or my sister for forgiveness. You know, I, you know let, me, let me, I'll connect with them tomorrow. Or you're thinking, you know, I'll, I'll connect with them next weekend or next week when I see them at work. and all. You know, I'll connect with them next month. No. Jesus says, do it quickly. Agree with your adversary quickly. Do you think that delaying it will make it better? There's a saying, you know what, time will heal all wounds. Well, you know what, I don't think it can heal it, but it will leave so much scars or big scars. Do you think that anger left unchecked will heal itself? Most likely not. You know, most likely it will just fester more and more. Yes, you do need time to cool down before you talk to someone. But don't allow it to linger. Don't allow the enemy to take a foothold of that, that anger 
and it gets bigger and bigger. Agree with your adversary quickly. See, what is hindering you from doing this right now? Do you see how serious this is? This is Jesus talking to us. These are Jesus' words. You're about to offer a sacrifice to be one with God. And Jesus said, leave your gift there and before the altar and go. Be reconciled with your brother first. That horizontal relationship. Then you can come back and with your heavenly father, that vertical relationship, and then offer your gift. So the first ingredient needed to being reconciled with another according to our text, is there's that quickness. Don't wait. Do it as soon as you can. Second ingredient is being reconciled requires us to have humility. It is not about your rights anymore. It's about making things right. It's about fixing that separation, taking that wedge out so that the relationship is once again reunited. So we must have the humility to accept the responsibility and the consequence of our wrongdoing. The great ex example of humility is Jesus Christ. In Philippians 2.8, it says, being found in appearance as a man, Jesus becoming as a man, that's already a sign of humility right there. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. See, I see humility in Jesus Christ. So for me, I kind of see humility this way too. Humility. It's not about being meek or weak that people can trample all over you. Sometimes we feel like, oh, someone is so, so you know, humble, filled with humility. It's not about the weak and the meek that people can take advantage of you. I see it this way. Humility, it's, it's a matter of position. It's me knowing my position, that I am a sinner saved by God and I am in need of God. In all that I do, God must get the glory. He is God. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. I am human and sinful and I am saved by grace. I am in need of God. It was grace and mercy and forgiveness. I give myself to Him so I can follow and praise Him and glorify him. John the Baptist puts it this way. I love it. And he says, in John 3, 30, he says, he must increase. Jesus must increase. But I must decrease. That's humility. Knowing your position. It's about Jesus going up and me going down as I praise him. See, I'm not, if I'm not the one that made the offense, I will make the first move and admit that I have done wrong. If I'm the one that offended someone, I'll make the first move. I'll swallow my pride and make that courageous step. If I'm the one that's been offended, I will offer forgiveness. See, it's not about me, but what Jesus wants me to do. And more importantly, what Jesus wants me to be. That is to be like him, having humility. A relationship separated must be now be reunited through our quickness in action and humility of heart to restoration. See, it is possible to be restored. Third ingredient is forgiveness. I've shared this with a church family before. Early in our marriage, I learned forgiveness from Sandra, actually using the words forgive. Because when we got into, I can't even remember what it is because we've forgiven it a long time ago. But there was something, there was a wedge between me and her. And she did something wrong. She approached me and says, Ian, I'm sorry that I did this and this and this. Can you please forgive me? And that's my first time hearing that from someone asking for my forgiveness. Because I'm used to, you know, and I've heard the words, I'm sorry. I've heard the word, I apologize, but not the word, no, can you forgive me? And I answered, I forgive you. And that has been something that we cultivate in our marriage a lot. That we forgive each other and we ask for forgiveness as quickly as we can. We try not to make it linger for so long. And we try to 
instill this to our children also if we have wronged their children we ask for forgiveness and we instill it in them for them to ask each other for forgiveness and to forgive each other see i want our broken relationship to be fixed so why should we do it why should we forgive you know why? because jesus did it in ephesians 4 32 be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving one another as god in christ forgave you jesus addresses not just how we act but who we are it's about us being transformed to be more like him and it made me wonder i wonder how many marriages could have worked out if people were quick in acting out of love and humility and say the words, I'm sorry, forgive me. I wonder how many church splits would have been prevented if people would quickly humble themselves and seek forgiveness and restoration and being reconciled. I wonder how many wars could have been prevented? How many families would have remained healthy and intact? I wonder what kind of a world we would have if we would act and be more like Jesus Christ. And quickly, with humility, forgive. See, this will happen someday when Jesus comes back. Jesus will mend, will mend all the broken relationships to fully reunite us with himself completely and eternally for people who have accepted him as their lord and personal savior a relationship that's been separated can be reunited can be reconciled act quickly don't let time pass by have humility like jesus christ forgive and ask for forgiveness let us follow the example of christ no, as we wait for the coming of Jesus Christ, Jesus instituted communion with him and with others as we partake of the bread and the wine. I know it's not communion Sunday today. Our church practices that once a month, the first Sunday of the month, we partake of communion. And it's been a long time since we have partaken of communion together as a church family in our church building. And this coming November, three weeks from now, we will be having communion together as a church family. And I look forward to that. See, communion is a reminder of the gospel story. Once we were united with God, but because of our sin, our relationship with God got separated. Sin put a wedge between us and God. But because of Jesus' love, his body that was broken, his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, we are once again reconciled and reunited with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A relationship that separated was reunited through Jesus Christ. A relationship separated was reconciled because of Jesus' humility, his obedience, and love. Love demonstrated on the cross and power demonstrated in the resurrection. Jesus re resurrected from the dead. During communion, in most churches, before communion, a pastor would say something like this. It is our church's tradition to invite all baptized Christians who are both right with God and right with each other to participate in the Lord's Supper. Right in your relationship with God, right in your relationship with others. You might be thinking, why do all churches who might partake of communion says this? Well, it's actually found in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29. And let me read it to you. You can follow here on, this, on the screen beside me. It says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 
So communion is a serious matter. It's a beautiful thing, and we should not take it lightly. Be reconciled horizontally and vertically with people and with God. Allow me to wrap it up. You know, let's look at SPAT. You know, this is you know, us doing our part, the application part. What you heard today won't matter much unless you live it out and act it out. So first one, for this week, for the next three weeks, do a self-examination. It says there in, in 1 Corinthians, right? Examine himself. But let a man examine himself. And you know what's even better than self-examination? I learned from, from someone is have a God examination. Let God examine you. In your prayer, ask the Holy Spirit, please bring to light my sin. Holy Spirit, please bring to light who have I sinned against? Who have I offended? And also with that, God, who do I need to forgive? Make God, let God examine you and bring this up to light. And ask and pray for clarity. What are my sins? Who are these people? God, just bring them up to me. See, the things that I have done, God, to offend you, bring it up to me. Things that I have left undone that you wanted me to do, just, just tell me. Holy Spirit, clear it up with me. And if God does, in the next three weeks, bring people in your mind and in your heart that there's been a wedge that's put there. Either it's their fault or your fault. Do this. Contact these people whom the Lord reveals. These people were there. You know, if there's a wedge between the two of you, between any of them, do it quickly and urgently. Don't say, you know what, I'll connect with them next month because they're probably not going to forgive me or I re they don't really deserve my forgiveness. Approach them. Connect with them. And in that connection, even before that, Ask God for humility. Ask God for courage. Be like Jesus and forgive. And also forgive them because the way God has forgiven us. So ask God, make things clear. Who are these people? Act quickly and urgently and do what Christ has done. Let's be reconciled with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And let us be reconciled with our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Allow me to pray for us. God of the universe, King of heaven and earth. Our rock, our salvation, our fortress, cornerstone, our counselor. God Almighty, we come to you and we celebrate in humility and in strength. And we thank you that you are God and not any of us. We want to ask that you bring to light right now who you want us to approach in love and forgiveness and in grace and in mercy. And we ask that you give us the courage and, and the open it is the opportunity to connect with these people so that we can show your love. May they see you, Jesus, in our lives as we act like you, Jesus. Help us to restore relationships the way you have restored our relationship with you. So challenge us for this week, God. Give us these opportunities and bless each and every one of us so that we can be a blessing. And give us the courage, God. And don't, and keep tapping us on the shoulder. Don't leave us alone until we do these things that you want us to do. Help us to be bold. Hold us, help us to be courageous so that we can continue to glorify you and bring people closer to you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.
Thank you. 